happy uh, to be passing things off to Eunice Yoon, uh, who is the Beijing bureau chief at CNBC. Eunice, how are, how are you? How is everything in Beijing tonight or this morning for you? I'm doing okay, and um, I understand why you had your dog barking. I was actually worried that the uh, delivery man was going to, <laughs> to ring the doorbell just now. So everybody's at home. The world's a lot different now, um, and um, it's great to see you. Yeah, wonderful to see you. Thank you so much for doing this tonight, uh, or this morning for you, um, and uh, I look forward to watching this panel. So over to you. Thank you so much, and thanks everybody for, for joining us um, on this panel about uh, the Biden administration's energy and foreign policy and how Asia. And so, uh, first of all, I think it's worth noting um, that within the next 24 hours, uh, President-elect Joe Biden um, is expected to announce that the U.S. will rejoin the Paris Climate Accords. Uh, he's, his administration has already laid out some very aggressive targets uh, when it comes to climate, 100% carbon pollution-free electricity generation by 2035 and carbon neutrality, neutrality by 2050. Expectations are that uh, Biden is also going to uh, push ahead with greater stimulus in order to try to build out more environmentally friendly infrastructure back home. Um, also that he would tone down his rhetoric on trade as the incoming administration looks to reestablish the US's role in the region. So how is all of this going to impact Asia as well as the energy industry? Uh, let's talk to our guests to find out. Uh, they are an established group of people. Um, Anatole Fagan, the executive vice president and chief commercial officer with Shamir Energy. Napada Karnastita, the chief financial officer with B. Grimm Power. Benjamin Sell, vice president with Mansfield Foundation and Han Wenke, a senior advisor with the Energy Research Institute at China's NDRC, or the National Development and Reform Commission. Thanks, gentlemen, for joining us uh, for this discussion. And just a reminder for the audience, in case you have a question and you want to get it um, over to the panel, uh, please uh, go to the chat function on the Global Energy Forum app. So um, for the panel discussion, I'd like to start first with Ben, uh, because Ben, sitting in Washington, D.C., um, how do you see the Biden administration um, moving aggressively on energy and foreign policy? And how, what, what kind of timing are you foreseeing? I'm sorry, I was muted. Isn't that everyone's <laughs> Zoom problem, aside from barking dogs? Sorry about that. Um, Eunice, you, you raise a great point that Biden administration is going to be aggressive out of the gate uh, on both uh, its foreign policy agenda in Asia and its cli global climate policy agenda. And uh, especially where those two are in alignment with each other, you'll see rapid forward movement. And people are, are very concerned about the prospect that those two policy agendas might actually come into conflict a little bit in particular, uh, the question of advancing U.S. Uh, alliance relationships and restoring the close alliance cooperation globally, but particularly with Asian allies in the face of uh, what is seen as an intense competition with China. And here inside the Beltway, as you point out, uh, hours to go in the Trump administration, we, we still have a strong feeling or consensus, I would even argue, uh, bipartisan administration and Congress, that the relationship with China will not revert to the Obama era and that it will not be easy to restore a, a, any sense of a strategic partnership in that relationship. Instead, competition will be the focus uh, for both the State Department and as well as the Defense Department at, at looking at Asia. So the, the potential for uh, the climate agenda and needing to cooperate with China and have China's buy-in on reducing carbon, on the one hand, is seen as, as contradictory to some of these other interests uh, focused on supporting allies, uh, especially those who have some kind of uh, struggle in their relationship with China, and uh, modifying or moderating Chinese behavior in areas of concern. So um, that is something to watch out for. Uh, where we where we will see rapid change and progress is where the U.S. can 
push for multilateralism, um, and the Paris Agreement is exactly uh, the right framework for that, for the Biden administration to move early. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ben. Um, Wayne Cott, I wanted to kind of get your thoughts on what Ben had said, especially sitting there as a senior researcher at uh, the top economic planner uh, here in China. What are the expectations, not only for yourself, but also the expectations of those around you in your conversations about um, how the Biden administration is going to end up changing the dynamic with China? Uh, I I heard uh, by the administration will uh, shift U.S. Uh, foreign policy and uh, allergy and uh, environment policies, especially for climate change policies. Uh, I, I think uh, this uh, welcome to, uh, from China. Uh, we. Uh, See, uh, this will help the slow down the temperature of uh, region or uh, some conflict. And uh, this will help uh, rebuild China and the US relations, especially US China energy cooperation. Uh, I mean, it's a clean energy cooperation and uh, uh, like he's frozen. Asia, uh, a lot of countries uh, develop the clean energy and uh, uh, try to some investment from China, uh, from US, and uh, help uh, together uh, uh, China and the US cooperation with Asia countries. Uh, and, uh, of, I, I, I think it's a good news for Asia, uh, especially for China, uh, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, in in China, uh, we uh, China have some uh, have uh, own have uh, uh, China's allergy agenda. Uh, uh, President Xi has proposed uh, to remove revolution in allergy production and uh, consumption and build in China's modern allergy system. Uh, this energy system is a very is a clean and a no carbon energy system uh, in the future. So uh, I, I I think uh, uh, by the administration they direct uh, U.S. <laughs> uh, uh, energy policies and the climate changes. It's uh, we are hyper China's uh, energy agenda, uh, but uh, uh, a lot of things. I, I think it's uh, uh, for China. It's uh, uh, means uh, opportunities and also means challenges. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, maybe we have we. we uh, need to face the U.S. companies in, in competitions in clean energy, clean technologies, uh, something like this. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. all. <laughs> well, Anatol, uh, Shanir has been able to take advantage of some of the opportunities that have presented themselves, of course, over the year, over the years, um, and that includes with the the Trump administration's trade deal with China. Uh, tell us how you foresee uh, the change in administration um, impacting not only Shanir, but the U.S. industry overall. Thanks, Eunice, and uh, thank you for having Shanir. It's uh, an honor to uh, represent Shanir and uh, the U.S. LNG business overall. And uh, we would uh, first start with offering our congratulations to President-elect Biden and the uh, 
and the incoming team. Uh, we are fortunate that, uh, as you said, uh, we've been at it for years, but, uh, but we are uh, on the eve of uh, celebrating our fifth anniversary in February as an operating company and have been fortunate to have had a fairly dramatic impact on our market, on the LNG market overall, especially in Asia and especially within Asia on China. The, uh, the business model and the, uh, the aspects of the US LNG product have been, uh, we believe, quite helpful in uh, continuing to enable the market to grow, become more rational, more transparent, uh, almost half of our volume that, that we have produced to date has gone to Asia. Um, and when we first received our export permits under the administration where uh, President-elect Biden was, of course, the vice president at the time, um, the, one of the key analyses of, uh, of that administration that was performed was the impact of the LNG export business on domestic gas prices. And I don't think at that time, anybody could have expected the, um, the scale of the LNG export business, which has continued to grow. Uh, we are uh, still the largest uh, exporter, but uh, are about half of the total US volume. It is about double what the then administration foresaw in terms of exports. And we, Chenier alone, are uh, by far the largest physical gas buyer even with all of that, uh, North American natural gas prices have remained very stable and have resulted in a very stable product that our long-term customers enjoy, both from a, uh, a reliability standpoint, where we have almost perfect reliability, as well as from a pricing standpoint. Uh, I'm sure everyone has seen the volatility, especially in the Asian uh, gas markets uh, over the last couple of months. And uh, you know the, the volatility that volatility in the prop market is uh, is orders of magnitude higher than uh, the volatility of our long-term contract, which of course enables our uh, foundation customers and our long-term customers to plan their businesses much more effectively and is a key component in allowing China to continue to meet its objectives in, uh, in a natural gas penetration, uh, raising that to 15% of primary energy um, in, in LNG, China for the year 2000 had another spectacular year, uh, about 12% growth. It is now solidly in second place, the second largest LNG import market behind uh, Japan. Um, in uh, in uh, 2019, that market grew 14%. And I think when we started uh, in the first quarter of 2020, if somebody would have said to me that China is going to have another double digit growth year in terms of LNG and uh, uh, mid single digit growth in terms of natural gas demand, uh, I would have been quite skeptical of that. So we're very comfortable that we're going to continue to be one of the enabling uh, technologies, one of the enabling forces to uh, continue through this energy cooperation to meet Asia's growing demand and growing thirst for clean energy and reliable energy. And uh, we look forward to continued energy cooperation that, uh, as you said, we've been the beneficiary of already with our uh, uh, direct transaction with uh, PetroChina. So quite optimistic about the future for Asian gas and LNG demand and uh, and uh, Chenier's role in that. Well, one of the, the customers for LNG is uh, Begrim Power. Um, Novodesh, I want to get your thoughts on uh, the the uh, what, what you think this, this fast-tracked uh, Biden administration policy on energy and climate could potentially mean for Asian companies. All right, thank you very much for for the questions and, and thank you for having me here. Um, we are truly delighted um, to be speak on, on this conference. So um, as, as I think many companies in, in Asia would probably face the same uh, uh, issues in terms of uh, driving towards the uh, zero carbon emission uh, by 2050s. I think um, uh, many, many, uh, including Big Green Power, we actually have massaged ourselves towards the um, sustainability and also to uh, having more of the clean and green energies in our portfolios. So, so far, um, just just uh, some of you that you may not be uh, familiar with Big Green, uh, we actually uh, a, uh, a power and utility companies uh, having the, uh, a total capacity of uh, uh, 3.6 gigawatts 
and we actually has uh, aspirational plans to go our uh, portfolios towards the uh, 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 gas fines, uh, both from from uh, LNGs and also from natural gas, and also towards the renewable portfolios uh, towards the 7.2 gigawatts or, or two times from what we are having today. So um, this is our aspiration plans, and and what what we have seen from from these uh, uh, movements of Biden's uh, administration uh, going forward uh, in, in the next. Uh, couple of hours from now to hear from, from officially. So there will be uh, implication of the, the rejoin and re-enter into the Paris agreements, uh, which uh, they show the commitment towards uh, uh, to be a, a zero carbon emissions target. And that would make a lot of the sentiment and, and a momentum towards the value chain of the renewable energies, uh, including uh, utility, utility companies like, like us uh, to drive towards more of their uh, having renewable into, into portfolios and expedite all the process to be uh, uh, in a speedy, timely manner as well. Uh, we see a lot of the um, movement, especially in the, in the solar uh, market, um, especially uh, from, uh, from the target that the Biden administration will be imposed to have those, those, uh, the uh, more, more solar, uh, solar farm to be, uh, also rooftops uh, to be happening. Uh, in the United States, and that would also driving more of the, uh, the I think the, the, the import tariff uh, to, to be uh, pushed, uh, to be more uh, reduced in order to, to increase the demand uh, of, of, uh, of the consumption of the, the, the solar module, and especially top five of the solar module will be coming from China. And then uh, that, that, that solar module uh, pricing, we also, uh, uh, in the same same time, uh, increasing the, the, the trend of the, the price of the solar farm, and also uh, I think the more demand also will be uh, incrementals and uh, investment into the the solar module manufacturing will also increase as well, uh, which will be driving the price uh, in the next two to three years from now to be increasing the shortage of the supplies will be seen. Uh, we we'll see that the um, uh, more capacities. And also investment be coming uh, through uh, the, uh, the demand that will be driving from the United States. Uh, so we will see that uh, there will be uh, less supplies to Asia, but more supplies will go into towards, uh, towards more in the in the states. Uh, that's that's uh, what we have been seeing from from now. No, but it sounds as though you're you're saying that this the um, the the more aggressive move on the part of the Biden administration could help act as a, a catalyst in some ways, uh, not only for the energy industry, but also for other industries you mentioned, manufacturing. Um, I'm wondering, as, as a CFO, um, are you seeing or foreseeing any potential changes in the financial world and the way a lot of these uh, more energy and environmentally friendly and green products are, are financed? Indeed, indeed. Um, I think the, every every companies, every countries also have an aims towards the sustainability, and ESG guideline has been the principle of, of the uh, doing business in in the recent uh, eras. Um, and having said that, uh, uh, we, every companies also have the target to have their uh, re reduction of the carbon emissions uh, uh, in, in a certain period of time, and the way of that is actually. Uh, we have seen a lot of the movement of some of the companies, such as oil and gas companies, uh, especially in, in, in the United States, such as uh, Chevron and Exxon, who actually have been the, the leaders in the oil and gas business, moving towards more of the renewable, um, uh, 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 I think, trends. And that would also uh, driving towards how to actually minimize or, or to, to achieve the, the carbon uh, reduction for things that they actually have been targeting. And the, the way to, to achieve that is actually coming from uh, two ways. One is to having more investment in the renewable energy. And second is actually to uh, uh, obtain uh, some sort of green certificates or licenses uh, that has been uh, trading in, in, in the, uh, in the um, renewable energy market, um, tr um, uh, which is we have been seeing a lot of the, the green born or sustainability bond that has been coming around in, in the market in, in the recent years. And uh, we will see to, to, to what more, the, more liquidity in, in the market once the uh, Biden administration has been imposed towards this uh, 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 implication as well. 
Uh, Wenka, I want to, I don't know whether or not you'd be able to speak to this, but, but something that I see here in Beijing is a lot more discussion about um, green bonds or blue bonds, uh, those are marine bonds um, in China as well, as just one of the, the um, efforts by the Chinese government to try to encourage um, sustainable sustainability and also China has, as you had mentioned, some very aggressive targets uh, for carbon neutrality neutrality by, by 2060. Um, at the same time, uh, Wen Ke, what I think is interesting is how China has been pushing uh, the idea of self-reliance. And usually we hear about that in terms of technology and supply chains. I was curious about your thoughts as to how it applies to the energy industry and what you foresee in China. Uh, I, I, I think uh, in China, this years, China do some things, uh, rebuild its uh, energy sectors. Uh, so in the, uh, yeah, you know, every, <laughs> everyone know China have a, a whole uh, production of coal and uh, have a whole uh, capacity of coal and uh, of uh, power generation capacity. Uh, so uh, one thing is, is China has, uh, reduce, uh, focus reduce the uh, coal uh, capacity and uh, coal power capacity. Uh, this one thing. Uh, last few years, uh, China achieved the, its goals. Uh, uh, another thing is focus on promoting the uh, fast, uh, no fast and fuel energy uh, produces, uh, produce. Uh, so China uh, uh, built more uh, uh, the wind power and uh, uh, solar power and uh, some uh, something. Uh, so promoting uh, clean energy uh, uh, production and the clean energy uh, substances. This is uh, uh, one uh, thing that reduce some uh, high carbon uh, energy and the one thing is promoting a low carbon energy. And uh, another thing is China promoting the uh, technology uh, innovations. Um, Current uh, technology changes, uh, 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 and uh, China uh, redirects uh, financial policies. Uh, the government uh, money, uh, government financials, and uh, uh, focus on clean allergies. Uh, and uh, China's uh, policies uh, uh, with this area have some change. Uh, the banks, uh, some uh, platform for financials have a focus on the low carbon development. Uh, because China's have uh, some uh, ideas for green development. This green development ideas cover our China, uh, government uh, sectors and uh, uh, peoples. Uh, I, I think this, this is China's doing. Uh, 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 recently, the work, uh, uh, I think these uh, policies and these developments uh, we, uh, will continue. Maybe mm. have some um, uh, stress uh, this, uh, uh, things. So, um, Anatol, I'm curious to hear what your thoughts might be on on that changing mm. uh, uh, policy that policy shift in China. That that on the one hand you see China um, kind of revving up and moving towards renewables and green technology, uh, not only because mm. it uh, wants to do that from a carbon footprint point of view, but also because it. Um, would not want to be as reliant on some of the more high carbon um, based energy products that China is constantly importing here as mm -hmm. it pursues the self uh, strategy. 
absolutely. And, uh, you know, we, we think natural gas and uh, LNG as the flexible and uh, destination, uh, destination restriction free component of the, of the natural gas chain uh, has a very important role to play as an enabler of uh, exactly that transition. Uh, the numbers uh, in China for, for everything are, are, are staggering. Uh, the amount of installed coal generation capacity is roughly 15 times that uh, of natural gas. But, but clearly, as, as Wenke was, was mentioning, the commitment is to continue to move away from coal towards uh, cleaner, uh, cleaner power generation sources. And renewables, of course, have a massive role to play. Um, China already has well over 200 gigawatts each of uh, wind and solar generation. Those numbers will grow tremendously, uh, but as will the natural gas infrastructure, the, uh, the, the path to energy security, reliability, and, uh, and an improved um, emissions footprint is one that is uh, built on uh, diversity of supply and reliability and the ability to backstop the intermittency of renewables, certainly in, in those market centers where that reliability and that generation profile stability is very important. So, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about um, a, a very large economy, um, second largest in the world, obviously, and, and growing um, at, at a very rapid clip. Even uh, I think the fourth quarter was a six and a half percent GDP uh, growth rate for China. and. Uh, and we don't see that uh, slowing and we don't see the energy demands uh, slowing anytime soon in absolute terms. They might slow modestly in, in percentage terms, of course. And uh, LNG is, uh, is a largely coastal, uh, largely um, sort of custom solution. And the natural gas numbers for China, again, growing from this uh, kind of uh, about 7% of total primary energy to doubling as a percentage terms uh, on percentage terms and also continuing to grow as the entire pie grows are still a relatively modest piece of the overall equation. Uh, we have no doubt that the majority of the incremental generation will be met with renewables. But we also have no doubt that natural gas has a role to play in continuing to shift the energy mix to be uh, cleaner while remaining uh, very robust and reliable. So uh, we, we see those as complementary and, and symbiotic and uh, and uh, Chenier continues to be a very firm supporter of the Paris Agreement. We were very uh, vocal um, during the Trump administration that, uh, that we thought that the uh, U.S. should stay in the Paris Accord. And, uh, and we look forward to rejoining that and doing our part in continuing to uh, make the gas value chain as efficient uh, environmentally and economically as possible. And Anatol, do you see, um, as part of that, do you see a greater demand for a carbon neutral LNG in Asia? Is that something that you see as well? I, I think that is unquestionably a goal um, and, and the path that we and, and other LNG producers are on. Uh, one of the issues that uh, has already been touched on is the North American production function. Um, it has not, um, I would say, covered itself in glory to date in terms of its uh, environmental uh, environmental bona fides, but it is moving in the right direction. Uh, today, uh, about three quarters of the natural gas we consume, again, as, as the largest uh, single buyer of natural gas in, in North America, is uh, uh, from producers that have commitments to continue to uh, reduce their carbon footprints. Uh, our scope one emissions are very modest. Uh, we have uh, less than 1% uh, methane leakage rates, but that is also something that we are focused on. and. Uh, and uh, the downstream functions of shipping and vaporization are also areas for improvement. So we are uh, fully committed to that. We, uh, we are very transparent about that, both uh, Chenier as well as the uh, upstream, uh, our upstream suppliers and infrastructure partners. Um, there's a lot of work to be done and, uh, and we are committed to continue to reduce the life cycle emissions of, uh, of our delivered product. And uh, we are very optimistic that uh, that we will, uh, we will continue to do that for decades to come. Ben, I want to bring you back into the conversation. Um, one of the, I wanted to pick up on, on one of the points that you had earlier about kind of this um, contradictory nature of uh, this push that we're seeing on the energy side to try to cooperate, have the U.S. Um, embrace uh, China on this issue, as well as um, some of its uh, more traditional allies. Um, uh, you know, I know that you're an expert on Japan as well. Um, 
But uh, do, do you foresee um, with this um, climate and energy becoming an area of cooperation um, when there are so many um, areas of conflict between the China, China and the US that, that energy and climate could actually become a game changer in the relationship and uh, change the foreign policy approach? And I was muted again. <laughs> Apologies <laughs> for that. Um, it's interesting. We at the Mansfield Foundation have run a, a multilateral project, a dialogue project with China, exactly on this issue, focusing on climate change as an area of common interest and trying to bring together uh, discussions, including fossil fuels, nuclear power, and, and renewables, new technologies, for how these areas of common interest can promote habits of cooperation in diplomacy and the international relationships, and um, maybe have some positive spillover effects, or at least some counterbalancing effects against the areas of confrontation and, and I would even say conflict in terms of interests, if not military conflict. There are many areas where the US and China do not see eye to eye, and there will be some very tender points in the discussions coming up, even under a Biden administration. I expect that the human rights issue will become a higher priority uh, under Tony Blinken as Secretary of State and under um, Joe Biden as President than it has been under uh, even the Obama administration or the Trump administration. And there will be more direct criticism of Beijing for its um, perceived uh, violations of global norms in terms of human rights. This is uh, a loss of face for the Beijing uh, leadership and it's very difficult to then go into uh, a, another room next door and agree to cooperate with the United States when they've been offended in that way. And I expect that we will need areas uh, of positive sum cooperation in the relationship. Business has uh, long been one of those glues and uh, energy business is certainly an important uh, element there. Technology is another area where the US and, and China have a huge amount of bilateral trade and cooperation. So there are some uh, positive elements. We need to see ways uh, to emphasize those. And, and certainly climate and energy uh, strike me as one of the more positive in our discussions, again, over the past several years in these trilateral forums or multilateral discussions with China. Uh, there is strong consensus that this is a shared issue and that we should cooperate. Uh, the question then becomes how much is there an attempt by either side to link this to any other issues in the relationship? And is it possible? I think the, the right approach is the multilateral uh, to keep this away from bilateral tensions or uh, political elements and focus on shared global interests that the U.S. And, and China can both contribute to and both show leadership for Asia and the world. I have a question from the audience for the panel. Um, the question is, as Asia moves away from coal, what does that mean for other coal consuming countries in Asia, like Indonesia? Beyond gas, what role can the US play? If anyone feels that they could weigh in with some thoughts, please do. Well, uh, I'll in, uh, you know, speaking outside of my direct area of expertise beyond gas, uh, you know, U U.S. has uh, transitioned uh, fairly dramatically itself from a uh, majority coal-based generation uh, portfolio to today. I think the statistics for 2020 are that uh, coal was about 25 percent of the of the total generation, and of course, um, being endowed with such a robust natural gas resource uh, that that uh, took up the majority of that market share, majority of that displacement, but renewables played a very large role. So uh, like a lot of economies, I, I believe that the uh, U.S. in terms of a capital provider, a developer, uh, an integrated equipment uh, supplier is going to be at the table in all of those countries, whether that's India, Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, uh, alongside uh, the um, the very competitive in a very competitive landscape that uh, that uh, our European and Asian um, solutions providers are as well. So I think it, it is part of the um, part of the ecosystem that will 
uh, continue to drive a more efficient and a uh, cleaner future for for us in all of those economies. So uh, I don't, again, speaking outside of my direct area of expertise, I don't see anything uh, particularly uh, U.S. advantaged, but uh, but it will play a, a role in in all of those decisions. Right. Okay. <laughs> Let me share a bit from from um, from the yeah, Asian corporate uh, side. So basically, um, we have seen that there are many many um, countries that try to uh, move away from 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 coal uh, to some other type of uh, uh, base load energy, which I I would presume that um, there are a lot of their uh, challenging in terms of uh, getting their support. Um, towards the, the coal fire power plants, uh, both from their uh, the policy and also in terms of the funding or financing, um, uh, so, uh, that that also happening in in the ASEAN regions that uh, we have to uh, identify where it will be coming from if if uh, if we'll be facing a big challenge on on developing more coals. So um, the development of some other type of their um, base load. Uh, demand with actually coming from um, more towards gas, uh, uh, gas fines from natural gas or, or LNG gas uh, in, in the region in the incremental ways that, that we have been seeing that. And also the expertise towards more of the advancing of the technologies and also uh, more R&D developments towards the new fields, um, types like uh, biofuels or, or the green hydrogen. I think we have, we'll see that coming up uh, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in a speedy ways to reduce the cost and also to advancing the technology towards more of the um, uh, sufficient and efficient ways uh, to support the, the, uh, the base load. Uh, together with um, it, uh, advancing in terms of the new technologies such, such as the uh, battery storage system uh, yeah, to, to cope with their intermittent source of energy. So that also we'll, we'll see uh, the spill over towards the, the development more uh, from other regions like uh, in the United States or from the European countries. So I think that would be something that can uh, uh, can be a part of the uh, supportive towards the um, reduction of the, the coal fire uh, productions and gearing towards more of the green and clean technologies uh, from both uh, gas uh, and also towards the uh, advancing technologies of the uh, green and clean uh, techs. That's what uh, we, we have some thoughts on. Did anyone else want to, Ben, did you want to weigh in or on that or no? Uh, I was just going to point out that the U.S. Uh, promoting more cooperation with other partners in the development finance uh, corporation, international development finance corporation being uh, ramped up, uh, expanded, and um, promoting, we know, closer partnership uh, with Japan and Korea in particular on joint projects and joint financing of, of projects within Asia. And that there's a, certainly a mandate there to push uh, these projects, uh, energy development projects away from coal. The same as the World Bank and the International, International Finance Corporation have already done. So if all of the money is moving away from coal, uh, we should see these uh, internationally funded energy uh, support projects for ASEAN member countries, helping them make a transition. Uh, and that should be pretty speedy. The one bump in the road, or the one worrisome aspect is Japan's uh, longstanding support of its ultra high temperature coal combustion technologies and, and promoting export of better coal burning uh, was at one point seen as a climate solution. But I think at this point with where we are with natural gas supplies, where we are with uh, the price of solar, it, it really is uh, an environmental crime to continue to push even ultra high temperature combustion. I, I'm sorry to the Japanese to say that, but um, we need to just put that in the dustbin of history and move forward with better, newer technologies and better systems to really, really sharply reduce the carbon output. So uh, I wanted to bring the conversation back to um, a, a theme that I, 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 I'm hearing here, and that is, of course, that there's going to be a lot more cooperation um, between the Biden administration and then here in China, but also that there could be a, 
a level of competition when it comes to the technology side. Um, I'm curious, and I don't know who would want to weigh in on this, but, but um, where you see the balance of power at this stage in terms of the technology um, in green products? Uh, because here, I often hear um, that uh, China is the leader. Uh, China's the one manufacturing the solar panels. China's the one that's, that's um, really been able to ramp up on, on wind turbines, for example. Um, so what, what are your thoughts on, on the level of, of uh, te technology right now and that competition there? Tommy? Yep. Ben, did you want to weigh in or Anatol, Winko? I'm sure others know more than I do, but I would just say <laughs> that um, the, the U.S. is certainly not in the lead but I would never write off the U.S. as a technology competitor in any industry. And uh, sometimes we've seen, as I was uh, mentioning to you earlier, Eunice, the U.S. lost leadership to Japan in some uh, information technology areas and, and semiconductor uh, areas in the 80s and 90s, and then uh, leapfrogged and uh, moved back into the lead uh, with smartphones and so on. So. I don't see the current status as indication of where we will end up, but I do hope that uh, the competition for technology leadership uh, continues to advance the state of the art, lower prices and increase penetration, and thereby help address the global climate uh, challenge. That's, it's, it's, this is harnessing the competitive nature of, of market economies and businesses uh, to achieve uh, common interests. It's not a, a nation state against nation state problem. And I, th I think in a lot of cases, we have technology cooperation between entities in different countries, sharing and buying technology from each other. I don't, I understand the rhetoric within Beijing, emphasizing that this is Chinese technology and China's leadership in this field, but I don't see it as a national thing. It's, it's a firm level thing and a global interest level thing. And that's, we, sh we shouldn't turn this into a tool of politics. Anybody else yeah. have a thought about it? Winko, I wasn't sure. Yeah, Anybody yes, else? yeah, yeah, yes. Go ahead. Uh, uh, I uh, agree with Lante. Uh, we need uh, energy, uh, uh, technology cooperations. Hmm. Uh, I, I think uh, we, uh, very highly depend the uh, on technologies. I mean, so, uh, we should achieve goal uh, for uh, carbon neutrality. Uh, very depend uh, on technologies. But uh, we have some technologies. You have some technologies. Uh, we should uh, work together. Uh, we can produce a. Uh, Best, uh, best, uh, best energy, uh, energy, uh, uh, something like uh, the commercials. Uh, so uh, I, I think if uh, like China and the US, uh, we can cooperate with together uh, the technologies the maybe achieve by a lower car, uh, cost. Uh, and the another thing, we should look at the uh, production chairs. Uh, the technology is linked to the uh, production chairs. Uh, uh, another thing, uh, we should uh, encourage the uh, local people and uh, use the technologies, uh, make some, uh, uh, achieve some green development. Uh, for example, in recent years, China have some moves we call the curl to gas, uh, curl to electricity. Uh, uh, because the rural uh, peoples, they use the bunker for cooking and heating. Uh, they use some technologies, can use the gas, can use the electricity, it, especially electricity from solar, from wind power. Uh, 
They, uh, I, I think uh, in you uh, the China's technology come from the US. Uh, 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 I, I see, I said that this is means uh, uh, we should have a, a one goal, <laughs> uh, neutrally, uh, carbon neutrally. So technology may be uh, the innovation, something is not very important for the uh, mm -hmm. business get money, uh, for business, right. for country, uh, uh, make some uh, green things. Uh, right, uh, right things. Uh, that's all. And Nova just saw that you have your hand up as well. Would you like to weigh in? Yeah, just just want to to add a bit that um, it's very, very aspirational target uh, to reduce the carbon emission uh, towards the, um, a, a zero net carbon by twenty fifty from every countries from um, from including United States. So. Uh, uh, the implication is that the the needs for for the uh, technologies uh, from the um, modules or the turbines will be increased uh, will be increased quite rapidly in a, in the in the past in the next next couple of years. So um, I think the challenge would be where it's going to be coming from, uh, what kind of the pricing uh, will be will be at in order to make it um, commercially. Um, you know, uh, feasible and to cope with the, um, uh, I think the target that uh, every country has. So, um, and in terms of the, the quality wise, I, I would see that uh, many countries will have the collaborative ways to, to make the uh, more efficient of the technologies to be able to cope with the, uh, the low carbon emissions. So, um, so I would say that uh, China will play a, a vital role in the next couple of years uh, from now in terms of the um, uh, production of the manufacturings, especially on the solar modules. And also uh, the capacity will increase uh, uh, quite rapidly in, in the investment in, in the manufacturing in, in, in the countries whereby the cost of production can be low as possible. Uh, uh, that, that would be the, the first phase that we'll be seeing. But in the, in the midterm, uh, 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 expectation, we will see that there will be uh, much more uh, developing countries or or, other, or maybe in the United States that will be playing a, a major role in the development of the uh, the uh, the, mod, uh, the module or the, the technology itself in order to to be more supplied uh, to to make the, the target achievable. So. Um, uh, China will be uh, having the in a next two to three years from now. Uh, the, uh, I think the the major investment in in the infrastructure, and then we'll be moving towards uh, having the uh, technology improvement, efficiency improvement from the midterm and long term plan from every countries from other regions as well. Mm. Another question from the audience: uh, How will countries in Central Asia? and their energy sources play in China's energy agenda? Wenka, I'm not sure if you wanted to answer this one. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I, I think China uh, have good relations with Asia countries. Uh, in, in China side, I, I think the uh, policies is uh, encourage the clean energy manufacturers and uh, go to uh, other countries around the Asia, uh, develop, um, develop the clean energy business and uh, promote the capacity, promote the, uh, the promotion the energy supply uh, for other countries to uh, help them, them do these things. And uh, uh, maybe uh, China will uh, continue to uh, provide uh, some funding, uh, provide uh, some uh, technologies, encourage technologies, uh, 
transfer to other Asia countries. And uh, uh, we also encourage the China's private sectors uh, invest in the Asia countries and uh, encourage Asia countries uh, the uh, business in, uh, invest in China, have business in China. Uh, and uh, we, uh, I think Chinese government, uh, we are continuously encourage the uh, people's communications. Uh, 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 maybe provide some funds, uh, track the uh, technology uh, experts, uh, some students uh, learning in China, uh, and uh, promote the uh, some personal uh, networks in Asia countries. Uh, I, I think this something. Uh, Hmm. Um, uh, one follow-up question to that is, how can the new administration approach Central Asia in mitigating influence in the region's energy sector? Uh, new administration, you mean uh, Biden? Yeah, the Biden administration. Oh, how can uh, the Biden approach Central Asia? I, I think uh, in recent years, China have a... Uh, its own uh, foreign policies and uh, uh, allergy environment international policies. Uh, mm -hmm. So China recently continued to uh, its, uh, uh, pursue its uh, policy goals, uh, uh, maintain good relations with uh, Asia countries. But sometimes uh, some trouble with Asia countries. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, some countries maybe uh, they should uh, select a side uh, between the US and China is bad things. I, I think uh, uh, Biden administration will cancel this, uh, where. Uh, Biden, I, I, I noticed Biden administration's foreign policies is maintaining the uh, cooperation with Asia countries, maintain cooperation with China, uh, uh, especially uh, so, uh, especially in the energy and the clean energy uh, and the climate change. I, I think China and the US. Uh, foreign policies and other policies is the same direction. We, mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, so the cooperation is much more than the uh, compet competitions. Mm -hmm. So it uh, helps. We, I, I think China have confidence <laughs> uh, with the US uh, uh, cooperation uh, in Asia countries. Mm. Right. So, um, Anastal Ben, I'm not sure if you wanted to weigh in on that, but I also noticed the time, and it looks as though we have about five, six minutes left. And so, because of that, I was wondering, I wanted to ask all of all four of you what you think the biggest challenge is for the Biden administration to pull off this uh, very ambitious climate agenda and what you're most worried about in your assumptions about how quickly this will, the policies will roll out. From our vantage point, the, um, the issue is really one of scale. Uh, the commitment is clearly there and the, the resources and technologies are largely in place. Um, to some of the previous uh, questions and, and issues that were raised, you know, the the road to uh, energy security is uh, is paved with diversity of supply and diversity of of commercial arrangements and and the successes in the energy system of the future uh, we think will will rely largely on those building blocks. So we see continued um, uh, decreases in cost for renewable energy. We see continuous improvements in in the system. Uh, continued. 
uh, price declines for uh, for battery storage as, as a backup to intermittency. And we think all of those tools will be necessary to continue to uh, to reduce the environmental footprint and achieve that with uh, with the most uh, efficient formulas possible in order to have as little of a headwind on on the global uh, economy as possible. And uh, you know we think one of the things that uh, that the Biden administration comes in being endowed with is a lot of these tools. Uh, very low and efficient uh, natural gas prices domestically, continued attractive resources in terms of developing domestic renewables and uh, and displacing solid fuel power plants. And that is a dynamic that we think will uh, will play out globally. And uh, we look forward to uh, to supporting all of our partners as, uh, as we go down that path. Ben? Oh, well, Anatole really had the excellent answer to that question there. That was <laughs> I would um, I would say first the Biden administration has to focus on uh, domestic uh, concerns. Uh, the U.S. is reeling from the coronavirus. We haven't talked about it very uh, significantly tonight, but job one is certainly going to be domestic recovery, uh, of return to normalcy here, and. I think that leaves much less room than you might see at a normal transition period or that Biden and his team might want to push, you know, actively on these other agendas, these global uh, cooperation agendas that they will work on, um, but maybe not with as much uh, emphasis and much attention as, as would otherwise be the case. Um, I, I do think that the, the new technology, I'm a technology optimist, and I think we've seen, uh, even in this period of the Trump administration, when it was a, not a diplomacy-focused climate policy at all, the opposite of it, but we've seen real progress. And that progress hasn't been driven by diplomacy, it hasn't been driven by government-to-government -government agreements, or even by uh, large-scale subsidies or a carbon tax. It's been driven by these amazing advances in technology. Uh, both in the natural gas sector, as Anatole has discussed, but also in the solar and, and wind sectors. And so we're likely to see that. I hope to see it also in the nuclear power sector and to see the diversity of power sources that provide the stability he's already described. But I don't know that we need a blockbuster diplomatic miracle of all the nations in the world agreeing to some radical uh, government-induced policy. I'm a, a Democrat and I love government. But I think in this case, uh, we should uh, really rely mostly on these amazing advances in technology to help us achieve these goals. As, as, as Anatole also said, the most cost-effective way to achieve the goal we have to achieve. We have to get there. Yeah. But um, no, no. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Ben. I'm just going to, I'm looking at the time. So I just sorry. wanted to make sure I'm that done. I opened it. <laughs> Sorry about that. I apologize. Uh, Nova Desh, what, what about you? What, what advice would you give to the Biden administration? What, it, what challenges do you see? Right. Um, firstly, I, I'm, I'm very pleased um, personally to see Biden's administrations actually put, put their high emphasis to have their, um, the target of um, uh, zero emissions uh, to be in place and re-entering into the um, uh, Paris Agreement. So I think that's a good news, and I think uh, global warming. The um, um, I think that the carbon footprint has been our top priorities globally. So I think we have to put our hands together, put the other geo geopolitical aside uh, about the um, some conflicting aside, and getting this thing to be uh, our common goal, and and make this thing happen uh, for real. You know, um, we have. I think many of the uh, renewable energy value chain has has um, greatly uh, appreciate and and very highly contributed uh, to to this commitment as well, uh, including uh, us ourselves, Big Green Power, and other companies uh, in in the value chain also would uh, I think put our hands to drive this thing going forward in a sustainable way, both in terms of the technical development, advancing the technologies to the financing mechanisms to make it more liquidity and to drive. Um, to what the zero emission target. Thank you. And Wenka, I don't know, we only have about 30 seconds, a minute and a half or something. So I uh, just want to get your thoughts on what you think the challenges are. Uh, uh, 
Uh, I think I, I have said that the uh, Biden administration the foreign and uh, energy policies agenda uh, means the ch challenges and opportunities for China. And uh, for me, I, I, I think the Biden uh, energy and climate change agenda challenges for uh, for me, for ERI, we should uh, very, very deeply China's strategy and plan for clean development, for low carbon mm. development. Mm. And uh, this is our uh, task. <laughs> so, uh, uh, <laughs> I'd like to thank get you. More optimistic spin that all of you have given when I was asking about challenges and obstacles looking forward. Um, and so I just want to say thank you so much for for being part of this panel and thank you to the, the audience uh, for also um, listening in and, and tuning in. Um, and now I'd just like to hand things over to Randy. Randy. Thank you, Eunice. And uh, thanks to all the panels panelists for really a remarkable start to our morning agenda uh, focused on Asia.